And we're live. Welcome to Earful of Dirt's Extras, uh, Rugby Techniques, and we are focusing on the one three three one uh rugby attack slash offense for the American lingo system. Um, and I've got the director of rugby at TSV Handelsheim. I think I said it right this time. Yeah, it's um, getting better. But uh, Gordon Hamlin back to uh, talk. So let's get into uh, a little bit of what we did last episode, and then we'll move forward to um, this offense that is most famously used by Michael Cheka's Wallabies, the Exeter Chiefs, and the Springboks. Um, yeah, so we've been started with the the way the modern defense has changed with rugby league. We talked briefly about how two four two has or was uh, implemented because the whole point is to try and hold with. We want to keep we want to keep our attackers wide. We want to make the use of our modern day forwards, which are technically they've got better skills, they're stronger, fitter, faster, um, they're more prepared because of the advances in um, video analysis, for example, and just the whole uh, psyche has, has changed. You know, the attitudes, the, the forwards want to be involved, the forwards want to make decisions, and, and, and they really want to be difference makers now. So that's why the game has, has shifted, because as we said in the last episode, it's not just 9, 10, 13 making the, the difference. It's, it's, it's a 15-man game, and that's what we've transitioned to. So that's kind of what we've covered. So why? Um, you know, we've got line breaks. They happen differently in the Northern Hemisphere for, uh, compared to, you know, the Southern Hemisphere, specifically, you know, South Africa and New Zealand being different. Um, you know, forwards, again, weren't skilled, but more physical. Now we've got more skills and just as physical. Yeah, so, I mean, just look at the body profiles of an English uh, premiership player or a South African rugby player. I mean, the South Africans are the biggest men in the world <laughs> that come when it comes to playing rugby. So they needed this, um, how they make line breaks, should I say, is very different than how a, a New Zealander would make it. They make line breaks by being ferocious at the point of contact, by using their size, their strength, and their speed to break the line. So they, they get a lot more um, half gaps and line breaks in the middle of the field than you would out wide with more uh, like smaller and, and faster and skillful players. And so who uses the one three three one? I mean, I've talked, I touched a little bit with Australia, um, the Chiefs and South Africa, mm -hmm. but there's more than that. Um, they would be, it's actually, it's, it's pretty common at club rugby, um, now because it's such a simple formation to, to execute. Uh, you're right. Those three biggest teams are probably the most prominent teams. Um, the Crusaders actually used one, three, three, one, three or four years ago. They did it for one year and it didn't work out for them. So they switched back to what they know. Um, but it's, yeah, it's mainly South Africa. It's mainly uh, countries which have large physical forwards. France uses it uh, as much as France does play systems and shapes. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah I, I definitely, I think the more I've I learned uh, about rugby, uh, I've seen it. I think we probably did it in my first two clubs i wouldn't i wouldn't really know what kind of system we would use we did we did a lot more work with the backs when i was for some reason the back for one year but in my latest club you definitely see how technical coaching has come forward at least because they're installing it uh you know and we they went from one two options last year to working on one option going into the beginning of the season so I think we'll see an evolution and we'll move to two options uh, with this offense, but I think they wanted to just make it simple rather than, um, you know, complicated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a very good uh, attack or, or shape for 
um, new players. You know, you can give players specific roles and, and that's all they have to do. So that's why it's quite prevalent in the US. It's quite prevalent in club rugby, as I said, because it's it's simple. You don't, there's not, you can do it where you really only have to make one or two decisions. That's run or pass. And if your players, if that's all they have to think about, well, then they can act and they can execute their skills much, much better than being worried about, oh, I have six decisions to make here, which is the right one, and then trying to cycle through them at an appropriate pace, and then you get smashed. Um, so it's it's very common in the lower levels, and just because how simple it is, and just because of the tasks that you can give players in it. So what is the one three three one shape or framework, I think, based on what we talked about in the 242, guys can sort of think about it, but uh, how do you group the players? Um, so the, the basic overview is that you have you'll have one player on the left hand side from the touchline to the 15 meter then you'll have a group of three or a pod of three forwards um, generally from 50 meter to the posts then another group of three in the post to the 15 and then a final uh, lone forward on the right hand side from the 15 to the sideline so it's one three three one um, but the groupings are it's very dependent on who you have. So sometimes the groupings, you know, you'll have the hooker and the number eight out wide. Or sometimes if you, if, if you have a really, really skillful second row, they'll be outside. So I know um, Peter O'Mahony from Munster on that left-hand side, uh, maybe two. But it, it depends on your skills. You, re you really need your most skillful forwards uh, in the wide channel. So Michael Hooper plays uh, out wide for uh, the Wallabies. And in the middle, again, how you break it up depends on what you want to do and your options. So sometimes you could get, you know, the entire front row as one group, and then your four, five, and six as another group. Um, I, I don't recommend that. The most common way is to split it up and to have a, a prop a second row and a flanker as, as one three, and then a proper second row flanker as the other three. So that way you get your, you get your physical power from your prop, you get your uh, ability to break the gain line and to carry strongly from the second row, and then your flanker does all the, the breakdown work. So the roles are very defined there. But honestly, it really depends on what you have and what you want to do. Uh, we, we'll, we'll get into it later about the different options from the pods and, and how that uh, reflects in the player or the cattle that you want there. So how do you hold your width with uh, this system versus, you know, say the two, four, two, because I, I think it allows you to go a little bit wider. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So in some ways it's easier. In other ways, it's more difficult. So like we talked about with the two for two, you're having your three zones of A, B, and C, or red, white, and blue, and you want to go from zone to zone. You want to be in the middle, then wide, then middle, then wide. Well, here you have two options in the middle because teams that don't have the skills or the time to get the ball from the middle of the field to the sideline, they now have this next option of a pod to the right or to the left of them. So how you hold width is by you making sure the pods have a decent amount of distance. So if you imagine one group of forwards, then to have a back and then another group of forwards, that's kind of the distance that you want. Um, and not like pop pass distance, but rather a nice, like if, if you get across the gain line, one pass, like a good nine to 10 pass and then 10 to 12. So you're talking maybe from the far right to the far left, like 30 to 35 meters in, in distance total, maybe. So I don't, I don't know what that's probably 40 yards of it in uh, American change. Um, and then the, the real width is held with the, the individual forwards, making sure that they're outside the, that 15 meter line to the sideline. So they're, they're constantly pulling defenders out there because like, just think if you have Michael Hooper out there, you have to, cause he's such a powerful runner, despite his, his size, you have to, um, keep him honest. So you have to keep a defender out there, or maybe even two. 
so you mentioned that you know like you've got these two pods uh, and you call them um you compare them to pistons mm -hmm. so you know how does that get you across the game line um so if we look at the options yeah so pistons is the best way i can i can used to describe it as in the left pod goes up then the right pod the left pod then right pod for example um to get across the gain line you look at your main options so the the main option is the carry at the front of the, the the pod and then if it goes into contact the supporting player behind can latch on and drive through the drive through the game line or you have the tip option the little short pop pass to the forward out, out, out to your right and again you're going to help and drive him through contact. Um, that if, if you do have your forwards and you just give them the simple task of doing that, then it's very easy to get across the game line if they do their jobs correctly. Um, if you watch the Lions tour this past, uh, well, not this year, but last year, should I say now, and looked at like uh, Tig Furlong or Vunapola, they were always at the front of their pod. And they're such like ferocious ball carriers, you'd give them the ball and they would make meters. Um, so you have one pod that gets across the gain line, it gets the defense going backwards, and then you can play quickly to the next pod. And then they have the same options, they can carry or they can pass. And they're just trying to get across the gain line as well. So it's just constantly just pistons, like in an engine, just working up and back, up and back. So we mentioned a few options, uh, specifically the tip. Uh, what are your main options in this offense? Um, so it really does depend on where you are in the field. So right now, we, we've just spoken about those forward options. As I said, the carry, the latch on, the drive through, or the tip option. Where it gets more expansive is when you have backs involved with these pods. So a lot of the times you'll see, if there's a breakdown on the left-hand side, you'll see the pod set up, you'll see a back in behind. And now all of a sudden, by having that back in behind, you have increased the options you have by two or three times. So there's the usual forward options, but then they can do a release pass out the back, it can tip to the forward, he can release the back if the back sees space, and we can attack much, much wider, much quicker. And also they can run through and be like blockers, and the ball can go straight to that back. And, and that is, so that's just one of the setups. Um, sometimes you can get where, Let's say a breakdown is on the far left. You want to really, really hold your width and keep attacking wider. But in field, you'll have a back step up in between the ruck and where the group of forwards are. So then we'll go, let's say, 9 to 10, 10 to the forward. And now you're bringing in a lot of those pass and loop options. So it's really about seeing what the defense is doing and looking for mismatches. You know, if, if you have your three forwards lined up and there's a 13 and 11 standing next to each other in the defensive line well you're not going to play out the back you know you're going to give it to your second row and he's just going to run straight through them but if it's some really really good tacklers and then you see out wide there's more space then you're looking to catch and pass you're looking to break the gain line recycle the ball quickly and attack a second phase again that helps so let's move it forward and uh, split up our pods in wide groups. And, mm -hmm. you know, between focus, between both, let's uh, describe each. We talked a little bit about the pods, but not really the wide group specifically. Yeah, yeah. So, so the, the wider groups, uh, it's, it is generally one lone forward working in unison um, with one or two backs. So the forward has to be highly skilled. It has to be, he has to be, he or she has to be fast and they have to be brilliant at the breakdown. And what they're trying to do, and it, it, again, it depends on the defense. If there's no defenders from the 15 meter to the sideline, they're just trying to run, run straight, hold their lines um, and just draw and pass. You know, put the wingers into space and then support. However, if there are defenders then, then your options get a bit more different. You'll see sometimes the forward will be starting out wide and he will cut back inside trying to pull defenders in field. And then the ball can go out, go behind him to a back who's in space. And it's really just about getting situations whereby you have three on two. 
and and everyone has to be able to execute a three on two. It doesn't matter if you're the the seven, the thirteen, or the fullback. So, how do we coach this? <coughs> you know, how do we how do we train this? What are the key, uh, you know, decision making, and also the micro skills that have to be used with, you know. The forwards chosen, you know, to group with the 9, 10, 12, you know, 13, and then more so forwards with your outside backs. Mm -hmm. um, so we talked about them as options, but not really the micro skills to start with. So the first, first micro skill is you have to be able to get across the game line. And it's not running straight into defenders. So you have to do a lot of work on footwork and evasion. You have to find weak shoulders or, or, or call it like aim for the limbs on the tree, not, you know, not the base of it. Yeah. Footwork evasion, work on your stiff arm, work on your ball presentation and your carry, because you really need quick ball with this. So you cannot get held up in the tackle. Um, the breakdown of the contact skills, because one forward could be out wide or it's going to be late to the breakdown, we need, really, really need um, talented and hardworking people at the breakdown. They have to understand the body mechanics of, of securing a breakdown with one person or two. And it's very difficult. It is difficult. But if you do your job right, you should win every single breakdown, especially with the way the laws are changing and the teams aren't putting many players into, into the rucks. Yeah, it's pretty, a, uh, it's pretty easy to form a ruck now, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then just get them working on, and this is just like you talked about as a, as a crawl, walk, run, just working on those tip pass, working on the release pass out the back options. And it doesn't have to be done at full speed or even half speed. Um, just they're the micro skills that you need to be able to do to execute this game plan. So it's, it's your footwork evasion at the point of contact. Um, it's the work on the ground. Like if you watch a lot of the New Zealand teams, You'll see them, even in England, it's becoming more prevalent now. After the tackle is made, how many of them do like an army crawl or a roll? And from where the tackle was made to where they're placing the ball is another meter and a half. So by doing that, you're, you're gaining extra meters. You're also giving a moving target for the ball. So the number seven has to try and adjust their running lines. You Best cannot predict where the... Yeah. Best part about that, Gordon, is like people trying to teach, uh, you know, like rolling in the rolling and mm -hmm. tackling in club rugby. And I'm like that you're because I mean, our skills, like personally, like my skills are not to the point where I don't know why people are trying to teach people how to roll in their tackle so that they present the ball perfectly every time. It's just it's really we're talking about like one of the more technical skills to be produced at a high level. And you're asking guys who, you know, aren't there and aren't nearly as experienced to learn how to gain a meter by, you know, thinking. Yeah, actually, I know we can actually talk about this because it's something I love. I did a coaching session last night and it was all about generating quick ball. And a couple of guys are going into contact really good footwork, really good evasion. They're getting good separation. They're getting tackled. And then they're laying on the ground trying to squeeze the ball through their legs. It's like, well, that's fun. It's not clean presentation and it's too slow. So what you want to try and do is, I guess we'll break it down to the start. You have to change your angle at the point of attack. You cannot just run diagonally because just like in a car crash, the person hitting you has it's going to generate more force so you need to get them off balance you need to plant their heels then it's about leg driving through the tackle and, and really i do i call it like the score the try process when you get tackled try and launch yourself as far forward as possible and like you're scoring a try or you're chris ashton and then you can generally get one or two definitely one maybe two army crawls while the defender is holding you and, and so you have to hold the ball, you, you get another couple of feet, and then it's it's really like, um, uh, oh God, I was gonna make a joke, like, 
legally blonde where they go bend and snap <laughs> you know you have to go there but you really have to snap back quickly um, and your job's not done just because you snap back okay the, the ball presentation is key if you place the ball and which i see is quite common the guys get in a nice pike shape and they place the ball uh, vertically next to the legs but where is the number nine going to stand to make the pass and if you're holding the ball at the end and I come through and I get my foot to it, what's going to happen? It's going to be messy. So, so it's kind of like, I liken it to a dinner plate. And you know, if you go to fine dining restaurants, they have a cloche on the meal and they take it off. So you want to have the back of your hand on the ground, the ball horizontal, and then your other hand on top of it. And when they're ready, you basically just lift off your hand like a dinner, plate, like a cloche. And then we can play really, really quickly, or you can pop it up in the air. But if you get in the habit of getting the ball next to your legs, it's very difficult to play quick rugby. That makes sense. It does. Uh, right. That gives me, um, definitely gives me a better idea of what I'm looking for when I've got the ball. Mm -hmm. um, usually, you know, I'm not fast enough to like really break, you know, with really break through the line at the game line. So, you know, thinking about just keeping, you know, my legs churning while being tackled and then, you know, crawling uh, gives me a better sense of what I'm doing. So, yeah. And it's, it's a very, it's a very easy way to train this. Um, just let's say, imagine you've lying down on the ground, you're on your stomach, like you've scored the try, you had the ball in your hand and get a partner or someone just to lay across the back of your hamstrings. And what you have to do is you have to snap to the left, you have to work around, fight with that weight on top of you to get good ball presentation. So you place it on the left, then you have to snap around to the right and just go left and right two or three times each, change over. And you do that maybe two, three weeks with at training. Um, it only takes a minute or two, but then you start to build the muscle memory and, and you'll notice a big, big difference about like not dying on the ground, basically. Like once your knee hits the ground, your, your job is not over. It's only really beginning as a ball carrier. Moving forward, uh, let's talk about, you know, we've, we've sort of covered individual pods, but not in depth. Mm -hmm. So how do you, uh, how are you going to coach your pods and then, you know, the, the backs out of those pods? Um, so it's, it's a much more progressive. So you start with just like we talked about the micro skills, you talk, start with just three, three on one, three on two, just at walking pace, execute your tip pass, execute your release pass, execute the footwork. And it's just really, really slow pace. So everyone understands the different options. Um, and then when the forwards are comfortable doing that, you, you, you bring in the backs. So you have the forward catching the ball and releasing at the back at a, at a quicker pace and just start building up from there. Um, and you progress to like the individual pods and you can put, we did some of this last night. You take, you take your, th take three defenders and three attackers and give the defenders pads. And depending on what, where the, like the widest defender moves then that indicates where the space is so if you have your pot of three have two guys in front of them and then one which will be either close so that means you have to be able to play it wide or he'll leave a space next to the middle and it just you know the defenders just move left and right with pads no one's going to get hurt it's it's still good work because it's a high level of contact and you still have to fight through um, the physicality of it so you so you're getting that muscle memory and you're getting the decisions so for that the middle group of three and again you just work on one middle group and, and then what you can do is to start expanding the game you can have it as um, two groups of three forwards and then maybe three backs and eight defenders and now all of a sudden you just have your two pods like two pistons just going left and right left and right and just work through your options and do it you know go left to right five to six times take a break get realigned again and just work again again and just keep going through decisions 
and, and skill execution. And that's the best way you can learn from those parts. Out wide, it's a little more complicated because things are generally done at a speed which is difficult to replicate out wide. You know, it's difficult to replicate uh, a three on two and the ball has been it's either a cross field kick or been a, a double skip pass and all of a sudden you have to attack. So, so the out wide, you've got a lot more space to work with. And I recommend just go at it full throttle, you know, not, not contact wise, but, but game pace wise and, and just have them, you know, if you don't have a, a marked field, just place a cone down, for example, that's where a number nine starts. The ball comes in, those three or two attackers run down. If they get touched, they form a breakdown, and then the ball is passed back out, and then they realign. Ball comes in, they make more decisions, and the defenders move around to, like, something we did is, if you have cones, so you can put, let's say, two red cones, two white cones, two green, and two yellow cones in different locations. And the attackers face away, and then the two defenders pick a colored cone to start on. So the defensive picture is always different. And just like that, start with the ball out wide, get it into the 15 to the sideline channel, do a phase, form a breakdown, and get the ball back out, realign. Just keep doing that over and over again. And that's how you work on the wider channels. Um, and then from that progression, what you then can do is you split the field in half, so you have one group of three and then one uh, wide channel. And just like we were doing previously, it's the exact same thing, except this time, instead of a number nine passing from a cone, the forwards get the ball, they execute either a, a carry or a tip or a release or something. Then the ball goes wide. And when the ball is wide, the forwards are realigning again, and then the ball comes back in. And just go left and right, left and right. And just make all of these decisions and and get in the habit of flowing from channel to channel because that that's really really important with this um shape and we'll talk about uh where it where it is not great later on i guess so we've talked about you know trying to do this at a little bit faster pace so mm -hmm. uh you know whole team you know, yeah. we've, ta we've talked about basically doing it with 10 guys. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you, how are you practicing, you know, 15 on 15? Yeah. Well, it, it is a mindset. So I like to, the way I like to coach is a games-based approach and, and through touch. Like we talked about this for 242, you can create zonal touch where you can only get touched in a certain area once or it's a turnover. Um, if you're going to play touch, uh, let's say it's one point for scoring a try, you can give it maybe three points if a pod forms and they execute a really good decision and a really good skill and it puts someone clean into space and they score. So what they've done is they, they've used what you're, the micro skills you're trying to coach them and then they're able to express themselves in, in a game situation and they're rewarded for it. So you get three points for that try, for example. Um, the scenarios, is again, it's the same thing for 242, you know, you want to set up a situation and then just work through that. So you have your 15, you say, okay, we have a ruck here. What do we do? Talk through the options and then say, okay, go do that. And you start there and then they do the options to the left whilst the right is getting organized and just work on these scenarios. Okay, we've got a line out here. We've got a scrum here. How do we transition into this? And, and it's a really good way because hopefully the players have the, the micro skills and the decisions embedded in them by now that it's basically just them on the field expressing themselves so everyone sees space differently but we need everyone to be on the same page so we need to understand through a, a, a complete calling system so it's like i don't know you could have fire or water or, or hit or carry or something. And everyone needs to understand what those calls are. So if someone makes the call, they may be seeing space that you don't know, but you know it's the call, so you have to get the ball out to them, if that makes sense. Got it. Yeah. So, um, 
Yeah, so, no, sorry. Okay. So team run would basically um how you would do this is you're practicing against air and then you blow a whistle and you're at the breakdown and you form pods again. I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah. so so yeah. It's obviously for your team run, it's better to have um opposition. But if you don't have the players, it can be tough. Um and the team runs is really, really good. And what I like to introduce is a thing called like the rewind technique. So as a coach, um, if you're standing on the sideline when you're trying to implement this, and, and that's fine. You let the players express themselves. You let them deal with it. But sometimes that can't happen. So if, if you're there on the field and you see space and during the team run, they make a decision. And you know it's like let's say that there's like five five players outside and, and then the player the attacker decides to carry into two okay he made a decision but how does he know what that is so by the rewind technique blow your whistle whatever just get everyone and everyone on the team has to know that this is occurring or else they keep moving you blow your whistle everyone just stands still take the player up pull him back say hey rewind back to that position you were in Okay, did this person talk to you? And he'll say yes or no. Did where was the ball coming from? They'll say it here. Okay, where's the space? And then hopefully they'll look around and you can joke about it saying, where's the space? It's not where you went for sure. But hopefully they would see the space out wide. And then you go, okay, play it from here. So the players will feel, I don't, I don't know if it's um, embarrassment or they'll feel like they made the wrong decision, that it's been addressed publicly, and that everyone on the team, not just the one person making the decision, realizes what space looks like. Um, so they hopefully, 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 sometimes they, they choose the same decision, and then you're left shaking your head. Um, but yeah, hopefully they make the right decision, the ball goes out, and it's kind of like a, a butterfly effect. And it's a really good way, because let's say that player carries the ball, Okay, now these two attackers need to come in to clean. Now our attacking line needs to get a little bit tighter. But let's look at this from what happens if you get the ball to that person, that person gets there. Where do you go now? So like in one phase and one pass, the entire shape and organization of an attacking team can change. And until we teach the players to recognize this and for them to be able to comprehend it at a walking pace, they're never going to, or even standing still, they're never going to be able to do it in a game. So that's two things in the team run which I find are really, really helpful. You know, you make a terrible decision, that's fine, it's a terrible decision. Just say, okay, I'll give you the ball back again, make a better decision. Uh, and that's, that's the crux of it. So what are the cues? Um, why and where, or different options? Okay. Um, so you're generally looking for mismatches. Um, ideally, the biggest mismatch or the best mismatch you can get is a prop and a lock defending out wide versus your 11, 13, 15. That's what you're trying to look for. But as I said, in the middle, you know, if you're South Africa, and every single one of your forwards is two meters tall and 265 pounds, a mismatch can be a number 10 defending in the line. Um, so it's about understanding your team profile. What is a mismatch to you? If your team is big and heavy, you're gonna be looking for smaller guys. If you're small and faster, you're gonna be trying to isolate the heavier guys. Um, so where the mismatches happen everyone has to see that and they have to realize like as i said if someone hears a call even if they have that red mist and they want to carry but if they hear a call that was a mismatch two passes to the right that ball has to go it just has to go or else it doesn't work going forward um so let's look at uh how you counter you know the one three three one like we did with the two four two, what are the weaknesses? You know, how do you defend against this? Well, the, the number one thing with this is line speed. So the more 
um, wide options you can take out of the game with line speed, and then it starts to become very predictable. <laughs> so um, I was listening, not to, it's just funny, not to, not to really mm -hmm. like go into something else, but I was listening to Egg Chasers the other day, and James Beardmore was like, of course I can coach uh, defense. All you have to say is line speed, line speed, attitude, attitude. Like it, it was like, <laughs> I was like, I don't think he's like, uh, just joking about how easy defense coaching defense is, but you know, like we talk about line speed yeah. and you know, sort of how I guess zonal concepts and defense are concerned mm -hmm. and you know, coming approaching flat uh, in a different sense on defense. Mm -hmm. And this, this is where you know, you talk about line speed, yeah, and I'm like. I was just funny when I. Yeah. No, no, it is. It's it's a it's something that I really like um, defense, and it's something that I think ninety five percent of people are doing wrong. And I think this would probably be another episode because my suggestions are a little bit out there. Um, but that's it. That like, if you can get up and not give, so you have to think of it this way: at the front of that pod is generally going to be a prop. Yes, you can have some talent and skill props, but props will get tired. And I would much rather put pressure on a prop than on a Odin Arthur Owen Farrell number 10, who's just going to take the ball, just pass it from you, and then you're left chasing shadows. So that's where you want to target. You want to target the heads of their pods and really just, you don't even need that great of a defensive shape. Just get up in their face especially out wide, limit those uh, release options. So what they have to do is carry. And when they carry, then you need someone from the inside in to disrupt their quick clean. So if you can get a hands on the ball, even, you're not, even if you're not winning the ball, you're just slowing it down. Because if you take all of their forward momentum out, it becomes like, I like it, it's just hitting your head off the wall. Because you don't go anywhere. Like if you go backwards once in this shape, you'll generally go backwards two or three times because they can't get across the game line. The defenders aren't going backwards. And then what happens, they'll probably kick a possession to you or they'll make a mistake. Very simple, that's how you counter it. You just, noise and speed is what I call it, you know, just make a lot of noise and run very fast. <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't take much more than that, you know. Um, where it's weak though, and again, this is not, I'm not a, an expert on it by any means, but where it's weak, what I feel is it's really, really weak um, and on turnover attack. So if you have your outside pot of three and someone comes in and jackals the ball and they play quickly, now all of a sudden you just have one forward or maybe a winger in that wider channel. So if they get numbers there, they can attack really really well there versus you know in 242 at least you're going to have two forwards in that wider channel um and that's what it is you, you isolate them out wide and if you can get turnovers there's also if you do get a turnover generally where because of how it plays and the fullback is up in the line and the backs are trying to work with those forwards there's huge amounts of real estate to kick in behind so if you get a quick turnover, a box kick and then just run in behind as an option, or grubber kicks or chip kicks, they're really, really susceptible to a kicking game on turnover attack there. So teams have to do a lot of work to transition from attack into defense. Um, so that's that's one area. If a team is playing 1-3-3, three, three, that's, what, that's what I target. Try and get a turnover and just kick it in behind. Um, and hopefully you, you win the foot race, you know? So... That'd be the three things. Yeah, if you can get line speed, you stop the pod the first time. They become just two pistons hammering into a wall. They're really weak to turn over attack. And then the the third one is, and the way the modern laws have changed with the uh, tackling in the air. If you have one three three one, you're trying to put up contestable kicks. If you have a pod consisting of your one two and three, they're not chasing any kicks. <laughs> you know. You need you need some you need some pretty fast front rowers to be able to chase a kick. You're too much. You're too much. Yeah. Depending on who he is, I mean. Yeah. Need some, Stan Coles, he probably could. Need some balls, and mm -hmm. but some of some of these hookers out there are pretty. 
you know, pretty fast players. Some, some definitely yeah. aren't, you know, yeah. first, first thing I think you're, you need balls and then you need some speed. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's the contestable kicking game. Like if you do stop them and they start kicking, they're generally going to kick long. They, they won't, teams will be wary of putting a contestable kick and having their loose forward and winger out wide chasing, because if someone catches and steps them, they're gone. So they can't really put a lot of pressure on contestable kicks on attack. So if they do kick the ball, it's generally going to go long or into touch. So that's why your back three can be a little bit deeper then. Got it. So I think wrapping this thing up, uh, one of the big things is, you know, you, you've got countries that use these, uh, these big, big, massive men in their forwards uh, to accomplish this more or less to, I would say, out physical the other team and by going a little bit wider Mm -hmm. with this. Um, I think it allows a little bit more width up front. And then, you know, we're talking about uh, how it pistons, I guess, for those that, if you don't want pistons, you could go with a leapfrog, you know, going forward one at a time, you know, and giving you with, I would say with less guys in your pod effect, it also has weaknesses because it's not, um, you know, you've only got two forwards to win the ruck in each pod when you get tackled. Yeah, yeah, it, it's all, and it's, as I said at the start, it's so common because everyone has a specific role. You just do your job. Like, as a coach, that's all you have to do. You, you give them the micro skills, you give them the tools to go out and do their job, and they, they just do their job. And you either do your job and you're, and you're successful, or it's easy to pinpoint where they haven't done their job. Do your job. <laughs> What's up, Bill? Yeah. How, you, how you doing, Bill Belichick over there? Yeah, <laughs> no, not quite. I do like a good hoodie, though, but no, I'm not, not quite like that just yet. <laughs> but um, so I think that uh, about covers where we want to go for the one three three one. Everyone, we're gonna cover one three two two next. One three two two is like the most modern one that they have now. Crusaders played it last year. Uh, Ireland and Leinster are using it. Saracens are playing it. Um, and it's like an amalgamation of both 242 and 1331. And it's a really fascinating thing, especially with MLR, because I know, like, I think the Sabercats are going to play it. Uh, Austin, uh, when you interviewed uh, Austin, they said they're going to play it, didn't they? Yep. Yeah. So this trying, will be really I think good. They're trying to, depending on what he sees, uh, they're going to do a multiple of 1322 two, and then do a progression to a two, 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 yeah. two, yeah. Yeah. which I, I mean, we're going to, you're going to have to really tell me about that. Cause I, yeah. I sort of, that's probably the most, I would say it's fascinating, but I can't find anything. No, that. there's not like, it's there's, basically, it's basically rotating triangles um, or L's, I guess would be better, better way. It's, 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 yeah, it's a tough one to explain. But no, so, so for MLR fans, it's really good because if you go out and you go, if you go to the game in Houston this weekend, you're going to see what they're doing. You'll be able to recognize the shapes, the structures, and, and the why, hopefully. Hopefully we can explain the why. <laughs> and if you, if you understand that, your, your viewing experience will be much better. And uh, that's why an we're here. Isn't it? An interesting comment that was sent to me about, um, we could probably discuss it at a later date. Mm-hmm. Might discuss it with uh, someone else because, you know, you're about to get real busy on the coach front when you get back to Germany. So, yeah. but, um, so an interesting comment from the last one was, uh, is rugby, depending on who it is, depending on who the coach is, still influencing, uh, football as a sport and offenses because Mike Leach, the coach at Washington state and formerly at Texas tech, played rugby when he attended BYU as an undergrad. And 
the guy, the guy I was talking to is like, what if rug his experience in rugby helped shape the air raid, which is a type of spread offense? Because we talked about uh, you know using a lot of space in the two four two episode. Mm-hmm. So that's something we could sort of kind of research going forward because. Mike Leach is an interesting guy. I did not know that he played rugby at at BYU until last week. So, oh yeah, I, no, it's it's yeah, it's it, it's fascinating, and I'm sure there is the footage in the game film where you're able to see different things. Um, like, isn't there a high school team that? Is trying to do, I just call it the hook and the la- hook and ladder or whatever. But he, he has his team doing a lot of passes down the field, oh, like yeah. so you had one a, wide receiver. What was it? Uh, a couple of years ago, a bunch of years ago, it was uh, I think, uh, yeah, Boise State in the same game did the hook and lateral and also the Statue of Liberty, which is mm-hmm. I would say your trick plays are probably your most uh, rugby centric per se. Mm-hmm. But um, I just wonder, like, about spread offenses is how much of an influence, whether they, whether coaches know it or not, rugby still has on the game of football. So that would be an interesting conversation to have, especially yeah. if I could ever get Mike Leach to talk. That would be pretty. Yeah, cool. yeah, just give him a call. <laughs> but um, yeah. So the next episode again will be on the one three two two. That will be when. Gordon is back in Germany. Uh, thank you for coming on. Uh, for all those that are wondering when the next episode of Earful of Dirt is going to be on, we will be back the 8th, 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the Eagles. We're going to talk some more Major League Rugby signings and news and all the fun stuff that you have been gaming at since you know we broke for christmas but again we're going to continue our technical series and our interview series has a bunch of stuff coming up in the next two weeks so signing off everyone gordon yeah see you pleasure's always